This afternoon I would like to talk to you a little bit about functional programming in Java. My name's John Smart. I work in Sydney, Australia, where I do mostly work on agile development practices, so test-driven development, behavior-driven development, continuous integration, that sort of stuff. Uh, so functional programming from my perspective is very much a, a practical question. It's very much what I can get out of it and what's, use, what's in it for me. Uh, so I'll try and just share with you my perspective on how I can benefit from functional programming and how I can make it work for me in Java before we get to Java 8. So functional programming, I guess you may have heard the word mentioned once or twice. It's a term that floats around a little bit. Uh, it is becoming very popular. All the new languages are functional, try to be functional it seems. It is, there are very good reasons that functional languages provide a good model. It's kind of strange that it's only now that they've really become popular because they've actually been around since the 70s or before maybe. Anyway, at least as long as I've been around. So, there, but now there are previously, previous functional languages that are coming into vogue and there are new ones that are becoming popular as well. So what's so great about functional languages? Who uses a functional language or has used a functional language? Scala or Haskell or, yeah? Who's used Groovy? So Groovy has some functional aspects to it as well. You can program Groovy in a very functional style. So one of the big things in functional languages is this idea of immutability. For a very simple reason, if you have an immutable object, an immutable ob object is something you ch can't change, like an integer value, or a POJO with only getters and no setters. So a nice thing about immutable objects is that since they can't change, they're thread safe. You can have them shared between threads and you don't run into problems. That's one of the biggest advantages. There are performance issues as well that make it easier to optimize. Uh, in Java, it's actually quite hard to do truly immutable objects. Even final objects aren't really final. Final variables, uh, and you can use introspection and things like that if you're really keen to modify stuff. So Java has limited support for true immutable objects, but you can try. Uh, but it does have a lot of benefits to uh, to try and make objects immutable where, wherever you can, where it makes sense. Immutable objects, uh, one aspect of functional programming, another is side effects. So in functional programming, one of the big concepts is that there's something that goes into a function and something comes out, you don't have side effects. So you don't have, you don't have a function, a method, that will change the state of an object uh, in a way that is unrelated on the surface, that seems unrelated to what the method call should be doing. So you call a method, you get a result, and that's it. So you should be able to repeat a function call and always get the same result. So that's very reassuring in that it avoids funny bugs when you call a function, you know what it's going to do, it's very predictable. It's also arguably easier to understand because you can see what's going on, you don't get the funny well, side effects. Uh, a, another interesting thing is that uh, it's much easier to optimize functional programming, a programming style which is a program that's written in a functional style is easier to optimize for so that it can be run in parallel. That's, if you if you use a very iterative, classic, not traditional style of programming to loop through a loop, you will loop through that loop in that particular order. If you use a functional style, you say, okay, do something on, this on each element of this collection, I will see later on, it's much easier then to, to let the compiler decide or to adapt your code slightly so the compiler can optimize that and run it in parallel batches as opposed to iterating over each element. So it gives you a lot more freedom in that regard. 
And you tend to get, do away with for loops, for loops and or loops in general, a uh, fairly old con construct in language and uh, can lead to confusion. If they get too complicated, they tend to hide the essence of what you're trying to do. Which brings me to my, to my next point, functional programming is really trying to put the em move the emphasis away from how and go towards what. So rather than saying how you're going to do something, you move a le take the level of abstraction one level higher and you describe what you're going to do. So rather than saying I want to iterate through this loop and add one and look at each element and if the element has a price that's greater than 100 then I'll add it to this result collection and then I'll return that collection that I've tossed everything into. You just say get me all the sales that are greater than $100. So you're describing what you want rather than how you go about getting it. So that has two advantages. It's easier to understand because easier to communicate what you're actually trying to do and it's less error prone because you let the language or the libraries do all the nitty gritty details, you just say what you want. So you get a lot of the, that in most functional languages. So you may have heard some, what's it called, Java 8 uh, something coming out uh, with some sort of uh, New newfangled lambda thingy. Anyone heard of that? Uh, <laughs> you may have heard that mentioned once or twice. I'm not sure if you're listening, following closely in the keynotes and whatnot. You might have might have caught a glimpse of this. Uh, so in Java 8, there's this thing called lambda expressions, which provides a lot of these uh, this functional programming language support for Java. So in Java 8 you could do things like this. Uh, so we've got a list of strings and what we want to achieve is to find all the strings in that list that start with the letter P. So what do we do? To describe that we say, okay, filter the name starting with P into an array list. Now that's, so that's not too bad. I mean, it's, it'd be nicer in Scala be more concise, but it's still, uh, it's still not too bad. You can still kind of read what it's trying to do. Be nicer and groovy as well, but uh, I mean, we're, they've got, you've got a lot of baggage with Java, so you have to sort of do what you can with what you've got really. But I think what the main thing here is that you're, say, you're looking at it, you're saying, okay, filter the names into an array list. As you read it, you can see what it's trying to do. So why did I repeat that? I think I was just pointing out what it looks like. <laughs> so you can do other things. For instance, here we've got, what have we got? We've got a list of uh, pets. A pet has a name and a species, so we're going to do things where we've got some uh, cats and dogs and guinea pigs and uh, uh, a, few a few static constructors and things like that. And so we've got, we're going to play around with this, see what we can do with it. We've got, uh, we start off with a list of pets. So what do we got? We've got a cat called Ginger, a dog called Spot, a guinea pig called Fluffy, and another dog called Rover. And so we want to get all the dogs. Do we? Is that what we want? Yeah, we want to get all the dogs. So filter, uh, get the dogs, and sort them by name. And what I want to point out here is we're doing two operations, two sequential operations. And when you read the code, even if you're not too familiar with the syntax, you can more or less figure out what's going on. So filter, then a get species equals dog. So you can sort of take a guess. That means it's trying to filter all the elements whose species is dog. And then sorted. Now here it's another nice little construct. We're passing in effectively an abstract method saying, okay, compare the names. It's kind of clunky, but it's be nice if you just say compare by name, but that's a more 
shows a more general approach. You're passing in a function, a effectively a lambda construction, a closure, to say how exactly you want to sort it. So it's a lot nicer than uh, creating an anonymous class, which you'd have to do in previous versions of Java. Sorry? Yeah, so it, it's still kind of uh, clunky, but it's certainly better than the uh, than nothing. But it, it's still kind of clunky. It's not definitely not at the level of what you get in Scala or Groovy or more more recent languages. Uh, here we've got another example. Uh, so we're filtering, then we're sorting. Here we're filtering. We're converting it to a map. And then we're sorting again. So here we're actually, the difference is here what we're doing is we're getting the objects, whereas here we're just getting the names. So that's something you do a lot with functional programming. You actually probably do it a lot in your normal code. I certainly do, but it's not necessarily something you uh, really think about until you start programming with functional languages. You take collections of objects and you do stuff with them. Who works with collections or lists of objects and does stuff with them? Anyone? No, I didn't think so. It's a really pretty rare thing to do. So you take collections and you manipulate collections. So you extract data from the collections, you filter it, you transform the data into a different sort of data, you aggregate the data. You do, all sorts, you do a lot of that. And when you have to do it with four loops, it gets pretty boring. So here's an example of extracting some data from a collection and all we're interested in is the name, not the actual object itself. And here we're doing something else. We're creating a, uh, effective, a predicate saying, okay, find me all the carnivores, the pets that are carnivores. Then we say, okay, filter carnivores into array list. So we're just finding cats and dogs because they're the only ones that match that predicate. So this second line is what you're interested in, filter carnivores. So when you read that, it's pretty obvious what's going on, much more so than if you had to do a for loop. Because a for loop, the thing with a for loop is you'd be doing that, you, your mind says, OK, I've got a for loop, so I'm looking over. Then you go in the for loop, so your mind says, oh, OK, what, what am I actually doing, trying to filter? So it's two different steps. Here we're saying, OK, get me the carnivores. So less CPU operations for your brain. So here's another example where we've got all the pet, where we've got an object called Vets Day, and we want to transform our pets into some of our pets, presumably not all of them, into this Vets Day object, which is presumably when they have to go to the vet to get fixed up. So we've got a Vets Day with a start of stay and a diagnosis. So here we're going to do a map. We've got a list, a pet, and we transform the pet into a vet's day object. So we give it a date and a diagnosis. So this is another example where transforming an object or telling, basically telling Java how to transform an object into another sort of object. And then you can take that operation and apply it to a whole collection. So that's something you do quite a lot with uh, functional programming. And here we've got another example where we're uh, pets, any match pet. We're finding, we're look. Uh, what are we doing here? Yeah, we're finding pets in that list where the pet is a dog. And we assert the assert means, okay, there is a match, there exists a pet in that list who is a dog. So doing a search on the list and checking, whether, checking for the presence of some sort of element in the, in the list. So these are examples of the sort of things you do in functional programming. Uh, but the question is, who's going to be using Java 8 anytime soon? Anyone? Anyone on Java 7 yet? Who's on Java 7? Who is still stuck on Java 6 but would like to be on Java 7? <laughs> Up and uh, I 
do remember a client not so long ago, they were still stuck on Java 4, 1.4. I'm sure they had a good reason, at least they thought they did. So sometimes these things take, I think probably because IBM was supporting it or something. But uh, sometimes these upgrades can take a long time to come through, so uh, it's a bit frustrating to have to wait before you can actually use it, this stuff. So there are a few tools, libraries that you can use today to do functional programming of a sort in Java. and. Uh, Sometimes it's really, really nice and elegant, and sometimes it's kind of ugly. Bit of a fine line to walk between the two. Uh, who's used Google Guava? Yep, fair, fair few people. It's, uh, Google Guava is a library that, well, it's a meta library, really. It's a collection of utilities and cool stuff that Google uses use themselves. It's got some very interesting things. It's got, uh, and what I'm going to do here is focus on about 5% of Google Guava, which is the support for functional constructs or operations. First one, probably the simplest to use, is the concept of immutable collections. Now, immutable collections are useful in Java for the same reason that immutable objects are useful, you can't change them. If you return an immutable collection as a result of a uh, call, you know that the method that calls that, that gets that collection can't go and mess with your internals. If you just return the, otherwise you have to copy it. But if you just, uh, an immutable collection is much safer than just, return. if you just return the list, if you've got a list of clients in a, in a class and you return that list of clients, obviously nothing's going to stop your client class of doing a sort on that, your, or some other class doing a sort on that list and stuffing up your, your own class if you're not careful. Uh, immutable collections make it very obvious that you don't want people to do that and make it actually impossible for people to do that. So a couple of ways this can work. You can have this immutable list of and then list the elements. That's really good for uh, any for tests if you just want to set up da immutable data. And there's also the immutable, there are copy operations. So immutable set, immutable list, copy of, and then the object you're, uh, you're passing in. Now an immutable just uh, one caveat, an immutable collection is a collection that can't be changed. No one said anything about the object in the collection. So it's not truly immutable unless the objects in the collection are also immutable. So what the immutable collection does is basically it will throw an exception if you try and sort it or delete things or add things or mess with the list. Do anything to the collection, it will throw an exception. But uh, if your, the objects in that collection are mod uh, can be changed, the immutable collection is not going to stop it. So it works best if you combine it with, an immu with immutable objects. If you really want immutability, you want to return an immutable collection of immutable objects. So objects with just getters is, your, is the simplest way to do it. Yes? Collections, uh, at the, uh, as in the Apache Commons collections? JDK. JDK collections unmodifiable. Uh, this predates it. Okay. So it's been around for a while. Other than that, I don't remember, to be honest. But immutability is a bit of a tough one in Java because it's very hard to actually make things truly immutable. just like finals, but uh, it's a, the readability of this is quite nice. I find that quite readable as well. So another thing that Guava borrows from functional languages is the idea that returning null is not such a hot idea after all. 
So, the problem with null is you get null pointer exceptions, but that's not the fundamental problem of null. Can anyone got any thoughts on what the real fundamental issue with returning null is? Hmm, sorry? Exactly. It doesn't say anything about why you're returning null. So there's a semantic issue there. Why are you returning null? Is it because no such object exists? Is it because there was an error? So there's, a, there's an ambiguity in what you're returning uh, which can cause problems. And then when you get null, how do you, know, how do you expect that you're going to get null? You return an object, say, oh, if we don't find it, we return null. I hope everyone understands that, because uh, otherwise it'll explode. Uh, but it's not very obvious. You might put in the Java doc or something, but it's not really obvious that that's your intent. Now, in languages like Scala, uh, you have this concept of not returning null ever. So that's my example of an interface We've got an client service interface, fine by name. If you return null, what does it mean? So in functional languages, you have this concept of uh, optional. So rather than our client service, which returns a client, and if it can't find a client, returns null, so like Hibernate does for some of, some of the calls, uh, here you return optional of client. Now optional of client, that has as much documentation as anything else as saying, hey, there might, I'm returning a client, but maybe there isn't one. So it's about communication as much as anything else. So in your code, it means, hey, I'm not getting a client back, I'm getting an optional client back. So that forces me to think about things like, hey, what am I going to do? So if the client is present, then I'll do something, otherwise I have to do whatever is appropriate if the client is not present. So that, it's safer than returning null because it forces people to think about process it, handling that case. In uh, functional languages, it's a bit simpler because uh, languages cater for that uh, at, the, at the, this level as well. So it makes it a bit more elegant. But still, I think the, the key thing here, it shows the intent that you, makes it very obvious that there may not be a client and you better deal with it. So you could also get, uh, use things like this. Color, so color to use, get favorite color. So that'll return uh, will get favorite color or blue, it'll return whatever color it was or uh, a default value. So you can, there are a few methods like that that help you define the semantics of what you do in those cases and makes it quite clear what, uh, what your intent is. So again, it's, uh, this is as much about documenting what your intent is as I mean, you can check for null as well. It's semantically, it's the same thing. But here, you're making it very clear. You're forcing people to think about it. Uh, as a rule, optional, you use optional to return a value. You don't use it as a parameter, passing, passing a parameter to a method. Passing an optional parameter to a method is kind of weird as a general rule. Normally, it's just when you return a value that you have optional. Uh, so that's a brief overview of uh, some of the stuff that Guava provides just as general utility methods. Uh, so now I want to have a look at another library called Lambda J, which provides more focused functional support. Guava also provides functional support and predicates and things like that. That said, uh, the uh, functional support in Guava I find a little bit clunkier than in Lambda J. So Lambda J is really a library for working with collections. So it's quite focused, it's quite, uh, uh, quite deliberately limited to 
manipulating collections in a functional style, but it does that exceedingly well. For, you get a whole host of all the functions that you actually use a lot of the time, things like filter, sort, aggregate, extract, so you might want to, like, like the examples we saw earlier on, fill, pull out a subset of a collection that, had, that obey certain or respect certain criteria, sort a collection, uh, convert a, the object in a collection to another type of collection, group them, and a lot of pretty standard operations that you do normally using for loops and, uh, and building results as, they, as you go. Uh, so I'll take a few, a few examples just to give you an idea. And you can see how it compares to Java 8. Uh, so here we have a, well, it's the same example as we had earlier. We've got a list of uh, philosophers and we want to find all the philosophers that start with the letter P. I'm sure you do that sort of thing every day. So the nice, one of the nice things about Lambda J is it works with Humcrest asserts. Who's used, who is familiar with Humcrest asserts? Right, that's your homework for your other guys. Go and look up Humcrest asserts because they are very, very cool. Uh, Humcrest asserts are a way of, uh, they're extensively used in unit testing. So rather than, I haven't got a slide here, but rather than writing assert equals 10 price, you write assert that price is 10. Sounds really simple like that, but it's actually really, really powerful. Uh, and here we've got an example. So this, what we've got up here, we've got a, uh, we're making a, what are we doing? Assert that. Assert that filtered names contains Plato, Pythagoras, that's an example. What we're doing here is we're importing a static method from lambda j. We're saying, okay, filter, and here we've got a starts with P. That starts with P is a Humcrest expression. So we could have say assert that filter all of starts with P here as well. That'd be another, it's, they work in both situations. But here the interesting thing is, so we say starts with P names. So we're filtering, extracting all of the philosophers who start with P. Uh, in one line. I find that actually a lot more readable than the Java 8 version. So they work quite nicely together because the Humcrest asserts are really powerful and you can do a lot with them. You can also write your own. So you can write your own domain specific custom matches, Humcrest matches, which goes to making this even more readable. So that's, well, that's the result of it. Filter starts with P names and you'll get a filter. So it's quite concise. Uh, so just comparing the three approaches. So this, the first section, obviously what you traditionally do. Yeah, that'd be fairly standard code. The second one is the Java 8 and the third one is the Lambda J. Well, I quite like the Lambda J one actually. Java 8 I think will have other advantages uh, because it'll work everywhere. Yes? Sorry? Yeah. Starts with takes a string, yes. yes. Yeah. But matcher, in Humcrest matches you got a gazillion matches with, for different sorts of operations. And you could write your own, so if you, uh, it's quite free, quite, when you're using Humcrest matches, it's quite uh, common to write your own custom matches to work with your domain objects. Uh, so, what else have we got? So here we've got so some of the examples that we were looking at earlier. Uh, so we want to find all the dogs. So this, arguably, we're starting to run into the limits of the Java syntax, but it does a reasonable job anyway, I find. 
because you, well, sh I'll explain the advantages. So you say filter, having on pet, spe get species is dog. So I'll break that down. So the having on pet class, you have to do that to basically give Lambda J a, a hint as to what, a, what functions you, what method you're using and what class you're using. Nice thing is once you do that, once you do the having on pet class, you do a dot and you get all the methods of the class, the pet class. So you get species and then is dog, that's your Humcrest matcher. Then pets is the list you're sorting. And then once you do that, you'll get your result. Uh, so I find that actually pretty nasty compared to your, that's getting pretty, not particularly readable. So you want to be a bit careful about how you use that. Yes? I've got performance benchmarks, I'll show you later on, about, lam about uh, Lambda J and standard looping. Uh, I haven't got any for, uh, for Java 8. I'd, I've done these operations, but I didn't do any benchmarks on them. I imagine being built into the uh, compiler and the bytecode would be uh, reasonably fast. And uh, Lambda J as a rule, it's, uh, it's obviously slower, but not that much slower. So yeah, that's, I would say that's a pretty nasty one. That's not particularly readable, but you can do it if you have to. So, and the lesson of that is that like you can do everything with Lambda J that you want, but sometimes it starts to get really clunky. You've got to be a little bit careful about the maintainability of your class. So it's not, uh, it's the old thing, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Uh, here we've got a more, uh, more obvious example. So sort, sorted dogs on class get name. So here we're just sorting by name. And, and here's another typical sort of operation you might do. You do, often you'll do operations in several steps just to make it obvious what you're doing. You might be able to do an operation with a one-liner but it's not necessarily a good idea because it will be hard to maintain afterwards. So here what are we doing? We're finding all the dogs and then sorting the dogs by name. And so you notice I'm using variable names to make it re relatively clear what my intention is, what I'm trying to do. Uh, and so what's this? This is an example of extracting with lambda j. This is an example where I'd say lambda j is from, uh, oh, that's Java 8. This is where Java 8 is a bit clearer than lambda j. So, I suppose. So, we're finding all, what are we doing? So, filter, we find all the dogs and we map, so we get all the names of the dogs. Then we sort the names, so we get a sorted array of the names of all the dogs. So if we did that in Lambda J, what's, sorry, can we have a poll? Which one's better? First, the Java 8? Java, who says Java 8's better on this example? Who prefers Lambda J? Who, who has no opinion? <laughs> so that's how you do it in Lambda J. So you'd want to break it up into steps so it's more obvious what's going on. I guess this first line, the having on, I always find a bit clunky. I mean, when you get used to it, it's okay, but it's still a bit clunky. Uh, so, but it certainly beats the old approach of doing it with just traditional Java where you have to actually implement a, uh, an abstract method. Yes? In Lambda J or in, uh, in Java 8, obviously there are ways to do that. In Lambda J, no, not, not at the moment, I think. Don't think there is. So 
You don't yet, but I suspect that's something they're probably going to implement because it's a really good point. I mean, it's an old, I don't think they do it as of yet. I think at the moment it's just transformed into, I haven't looked at the source codes, so I'm not sure what goes on behind the scenes, uh, but I'm not aware of any particular support for parallel, explicit parallel operations as of yet. But it'd be an obvious thing that they'd be likely to do. But that's a, that's a very good point. Normally, the, I mean, with Java 8, you may have seen, you can add a, basically add an opera and Scala. You add a, a signal operation in the chain to make it, para, make it be able to run in parallel. So I'm not aware of that for Lambda J. Or for other, or any of the other ones either, for that matter. So for that, you have to go to Scala. So it may, like I said, it's something obvious that you'd want to include, so I suspect that might be something on the roadmap. Uh, what else have we got? So here we've got our example of converting names again. So here we've got another example of uh, converting, here's the vet stay example. So how do you do it with uh, Java 8? So we convert the pets into vet stays, so putting, this, putting the pets into, a, a, sending the pets to the vet. Now this is, this takes a bit of getting used to, but I actually quite like it within, I think it does a good job of uh, getting around the limits of Java of uh, Java pre-Java 8. So what you do, you do convert, convert pets to vet stay. So, so far so good, that's really clean and obvious. And then, here's the nasty bit, this is because you, you haven't got closures, you have to return an anonymous class to say exactly how do you convert a pet to a vet stay. The anonymous class is simply a uh, converter class it takes a pet and it converts it to a vet stay, and then you have one operation convert, which converts the pet to a vet stay. Yep. The vet stay. Yeah, Java's good at that. But that's what you do typically when you're converting. The, that's a, in this case, the aim is to convert a list of pets to a list of vet stays. For the uh, for this particular. Oh yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. Yes, very true. You would typically have a, pro, a static, uh, static final class. I did some shortcuts I would have fit on the slides, but yeah, very true. For the actual, uh, for the class itself, you're right, I thought you were talking about the Vets Day class. Yep, absolutely right. This would typically be a static final class, but the thing you want to take into account is you've got a one-liner, and the only thing you're really interested in is, is this line here. So the rest is boilerplate. So I actually use that pattern quite a lot uh, because it's quite common to have to take a collection and convert them to objects. If you take, for instance, web testing, do a lot of web work with web tests, uh, you'll look at a, you might look at a page, get a list of web elements uh, from a table, and then convert those web elements to POJOs for higher up. So that the POJO, that at the test level itself, you're talking about POJOs and not web elements. And in that case, it's exactly the same pattern. You're converting your web elements to POJOs. You can also do grouping. So here we're grouping by species. So we, uh, so we convert, uh, uh, we get a list or a group of, for each species and then we want to find the dog, so we do pets by species find of dog, and it returns our list of dogs. Uh, this is one I've found often found useful. So you've got a list of lists, and you want to just flatten that into a single list. So you've got the flatten method. Very simple, effective, works well. 
So you might have a tree structure and you might want to get all the leaf nodes of that tree structure, all the leaf nodes of a particular type, you can recognize them. You flatten the list, you flatten the elements in the, because your tree is effectively a list of lists. Uh, you flatten the tree and then you extract the leaves. Uh, so what else have we got? Checking for existence. So exists. Check whether an element exists in a in a list. Uh, using predicates. So again, the predicate is similar to the anonymous function we saw earlier. We've got in, we're in Java eight. You'd create this predicate object. So pets filter carnivals and whatnot. In Lambda J, you have to use anonymous anonymous. Uh, classes. So you've got a predicate of type pet and then uh, that predicate has a boolean function called apply and then you just check, do whatever you want. So we've got the matcher pet uh, will return true if it's a dog or a cat and then the filter is very similar to what we saw earlier. Just filter carnivore pets. So find all, extract all the uh, objects that ma match that predicate. You get this pattern a lot, yeah? Are there any support for maps instead of just collections? Yeah, there's support for maps. Yeah, I'm, I'm mainly doing collections in the examples, but there are, there is plenty of stuff on maps as well. Uh, you can aggregate, so bundle, uh, bundle your objects together. And yeah, do so here. What am I doing? Finding the max from pets get age, min from pets get age. So what I'm doing there is max and min. So the pets can be sorted uh, however you want to naturally sort them. And if you had, for instance, if it were pets, it's, I'm sorting by age, but uh, for an arbitrary reason. But uh, in this case, all I'm doing is uh, grabbing the oldest pet and the youngest pet and finding the sum of all the ages. So they're built in operations. So in a real world class, you'd probably have, be, you'd be using the natural sorting by price or whatever. And so here's actually a real world example. Uh, so we've got a, in this real world example, it's uh, processing test results. I have a set of some tests pass, some tests fail, some tests are pending. And so I need an operation that extracts all the passing tests. Uh, so that would look something like this. So filter, having a test outcome class, get result is success. You get used to it, the having on. <laughs> Or you could do this. I mean, the thing here is, you get used to it, but that having on test outcome class, get result is success. I've got success, I've got failure, I've got pending, I've got ignored, I've got lots of different types of tests. That gets a bit boring to repeat that. So what I really would like to do is just have a method filter with result success. And the with result, that returns a matcher so it's a Humcrest matcher. And the matcher is basically a parameterized version of that expression we saw earlier. So having on test outcome class get result is expected result. So you do tricks like that to reuse predicates, to reuse matches. Make the, it's all the aim is when you start to see something getting a bit clunky, you hide the clunkiness away. Because the important thing that you're trying to convey here is what this line does. So filter with result success. That's fairly obvious. This is, goes into the realm of how you do it, so you can hide that away. But this is the most, the first line is the important bit. The bit you want to convey where your business logic is going to be. So, 
since it's Humcrest, Humcrest allows you to do things like this. You can put matches together and combine them. So here, we're doing filter any of with result success, with result pending. So we're finding both successful result test success and pending. So with Humcrest, there are a lot of ways to, ag to join and combine and mix and match matches so that you can actually combine and nest matches together. So what have we got here? So uh, we're extracting tags. So I've got this uh, uh, just remembering what my example is. Yeah, so here I've got a set of tag provider objects. Each tag provider knows how to return a set of tags. And all I'm interested in is the total list of tags. So here I do an extract, tag providers get tags. So I extract, oh, I'm going to get two collections. And then I flatten that list. So I just get one list. So again, combining and aggregating, that's very typical of functional programming. Uh, it's a, and the adva big advantage is in readability, you, when you get used to it especially, it becomes obvious what the intent of your code is as opposed to trying to figure out how you do it. Now someone asked about uh, performance. So these are benchmarks uh, comparing just normal for loops to Lambda J. So it averages out about two and a half times slower using Lambda J than uh, using uh, for loops. Uh, I mean, it'll depend on your code, but for me, two and a half times slower is not going to be a deal breaker if it makes the code more readable. Uh, so here's uh, just something that the Grava team says about the functional programming. And yes. I haven't noticed any particular, I think these are pretty big benchmarks. Or Sorry? Yeah, the question was how does it impact garbage collection? Because uh, it creates lots of small objects. I presume what I'm thinking is the garbage collection is going to be reflected in these figures because these are pretty long running benchmarks. So that would be part of, uh, part of that and the reflection using reflection and whatnot. Uh, so this is just a quote from the Guava team who basically say that Java is not meant for functional programming, so don't push it. So when you're using any sort of functional programming techniques in Java, it's true of a lot of styles, you don't want to go overboard and make your code so full of this stuff that, it's, that you can't actually understand it. So the intent of all this is to make the code more readable. You've got to keep that in mind. The intent is to convey the logic of what you are doing to whoever is going to read the code later on. So the intent is not to show how clever you are with your functional programming skills. The intent is to convey the business logic in a way that's clearer than if you had to do it with a for loop. So if we had something like this, uh, it takes a fair bit of C brain CPU cycles to actually go through and figure out what's going on. Whereas if you take something a little bit simpler, less optimal from a, I mean it's not a one-liner, but uh, uh, we're explaining the steps that we're going through to obtain our results, but it's making very clear what we're doing and why we're doing it. So that arguably this second approach is going to be easier to maintain than the first. Yeah? No? Maybe? I mean, it's a question of, a lot of this is a question of taste and style and whatnot, but uh, Jen, the point is you want the, uh, you want your code to convey the, me, the intent and the business logic of what you're doing rather than how it's doing it. 
So here we've got another example. Uh, you can, you could do this converting pets to vet stays with an inline anonymous function. Uh, but I'd much rather do it just with a uh, convert pets to vet stay because it reads clearly and says what it's doing and then worry about the details later on. So I personally prefer that style, even if it makes lots of one line, effectively one line anonymous class functions. Uh, the next last thing I want to point out is this idea of the matches. So I've been talking about Humcrest matches and the way you will often write your own custom Humcrest matches. So here's a very simple example, the one we saw earlier, where we've got the with result where, which we can reuse in different contexts. I mean in the actual application code that's used all over the place. And that's a very simple example. You can do much more sophisticated matches than that. It's hiding away the details of how you go about uh, deciding whether, uh, well, manipulating your objects really, doing predicate operations on your objects. So matches are not hard to write. You can either use them directly with these having methods or you can actually write a custom Humcrest matcher which is a bit more involved but uh, not rocket science either. Uh, so that goes to, it all goes to making the code more more readable. So I think the bottom line is these techniques are useful if they're going to make your code easier to understand and maintain. So I find them useful because I do a lot of work manipulating lists and collections and sets of data and so I find it makes the code more readable and maintainable and gets away from clunky for loops. Uh, it's, but the bottom line is you do want to use it with the intent of making your code cleaner and more understand, easier to understand. Okay, questions? Do we have these slides available for an hour Yep, these slides will be available on the, uh, they'll be on the Java one site, they'll be on wakaleo.com, which is the left side there. Uh, they'll be on SlideShare, they'll be available. Yep. All these, all the tools I've been talking about are open source. Thank you.